the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, and we're going to look at a couple verses. Now, I, I've been preaching this year several times, and, um, you know, when, you, when you're preaching the word of God, it's important that you hear from the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not like some, you know, uh, a jar you go and just pick a sermon out and say, I'm going to preach this sermon this morning because it sounds good. It feels No, you have to make sure you're hearing from the Holy Spirit on what he wants to say and what he wants to do. And I've been preaching this year, and for, for whatever reason, I know what it is. Uh, uh, God won't let me get off the subject of joy. Um, you know, joy is a, a topic that people get confused. We know we learned about it these last couple of uh, times I talked, but I want to go a little bit deeper in it this morning. And so my topic this morning is uh, the joy of the Lord. And my subtopic is going to be the choice to rejoice. The choice to rejoice. Like I said, we were talking about joy. We've learned what joy is. We learned that joy is a fruit of the spirit. We learned that joy comes from the presence of God. We learned that joy comes from the spoken word of God. We learned how to operate out of our, out of our spirit from the spirit of joy. Uh, and not from our flesh, where we're all emotional and ruled by emotions. But this morning, I want to make it a little bit more practical, because sometimes when you're talking about having the spirit of joy operate in your life, it's not as easy as it may seem. It's not like something you can just do, you know, because everything is going good. Sometimes you got to do it when things are not going good. You got to do it when things, when you don't feel like praising God, when you don't have everything you are believing God for. And so that's why my subtopic is the choice to rejoice. And as I go through these scriptures this morning, I want you guys to understand that rejoicing is a choice. Rejoicing is a choice. And it's not based on, it's not predicated or dictated by anything we experience or anything we feel. It's based on one thing. It's based on, well, two things, God and his word. And I want to show you in the scripture. Let's do a little refresher real quick. Nehemiah chapter 8. If you have it, say amen. amen. Okay. And I'm going to read uh, verses uh, 9 and 10. And Nehemiah, which is the Teshetha, and Ezra the priest described, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, this day is holy unto the Lord. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord, neither be ye sorry. Why? For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, to give you some background, what was going on, the people were, were very mournful. They were very sorrowful. He said, mourn not, neither weep. He said they had been going through some things, and when they heard the word, it made them feel mournful. He said, no, 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 don't mourn, neither weep. Because one thing we got to understand is that the opposite of joy is sorrow. And the Bible in, uh, in Corinthians talks about how there is a godless sorrow that leads to repentance, but then there's a, a worldly sorrow, watch this, that leads to death. A worldly sorrow that leads to death. See, a lot of times, you know, you go through something and you feel that grief, that you feel that sorrow, and you want to wallow in it. You want to just kind of get in a pity party. It's okay to grieve, right? But it's not okay to get in grief where it takes you into depression. Amen? Because depression can lead to death. Worldly sorrow can lead to death. See, sorrow can drain our spirits. Sorrow will, will deplete our strength if you don't watch it. And, and what he was saying here is, don't stop sorrowing. Stop mourning. Get over into joy. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if you allow sorrow to rob you of your joy, 
it'll rob you of your strength. And the, the less strength you have, the easier it is for the enemy to defeat you. And so joy is a strength. Joy is a force. It, it is a product of your reborn spirit. And the devil knows this. So what he tries to do is he tries to get us to be just like the world. When someone passes away, we want to get into depression and sorrow. You can grieve. Nothing wrong with crying. But you got to be careful with that because the Bible gives us a promise that we don't need to mourn like the world. We have a hope and a comfort that those who die in Christ are what? Not dead. They just sleep. We know where they are. We know exactly if, if you have a loved one that passed away, they were born again, they was born in Christ, they're not, they're not lost. Heaven is as real as North Carolina. Pastor Diggs is not here right now. But we know, well, I know where he is. You don't know where he is. <laughs> There's none of your business where he is. But I know where he is. And the same way, if you lost a loved one, you don't have to worry about wondering where they are. They're in the presence of Almighty God. So you don't have to worry about being sorrow. What goes on is we get into sorrow and it robs our joy. And so let's do a refresher here. Put up the definition of joy so we understand what we're talking about again. So joy is a perpetual gladness on the inside regardless of what we feel or experience on the outside. It's on the inside. And see, a lot of times we're trying to base our joy based on what's going on around us. But joy is a spiritual force that has nothing to do with what our circumstances and what's going on around us. The second part of that definition is joy is a calm delightfulness and cheerfulness despite what we're going through. Now, I want to make sure this foundation is laid and we understand what joy is, because when I get into my subtopic, which is the choice to rejoice, it's going to be important that you see this from the word of God, that we can rejoice regardless of what we're going through, regardless of how we feel, and no matter what it looked like, we can rejoice. Okay? Now, go with me over to uh, 1 Thessalonians. I want to show you this from the Word of God. Praise the Lord. And we're going to look at chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And see, like I talked last time, joy is the fuse to your faith. You show me a person full of joy, I show you a person full of faith. You show me a person full of joy, I show you a person full of strength. And so you have to understand that this is not just a feeling. This is a force. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse 16. He says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Look at this in the Amplified. He says here, be happy in your faith and rejoice and be glad hearted continually always. Now, he could have said, be happy in your faith, rejoice, and be glad hearted if you can. He could have said, rejoice and be glad hearted if you feel like it. But no, he said, how often? Always. This is important we understand this because a lot of times we only rejoice when things look good. We only rejoice when things look favorable. But no, the word of God just said, rejoice. How often? Now, this, this, is, this is not optional. This is not a suggestion. This is a requirement because it's important that we stay rejoicing and keep ourselves built up. Now, now, I know we operate in a world where things happen and things go, we go through things, and you're like, well, how can I do this? How many people know that when God tells us to do something, 
He knows if we have the ability to do it or not. He will never call us to do something that we don't have the ability to do. He said rejoice always. Look at this uh, uh, definition of rejoice. I, wanna, I want you to hear this real quick. Rejoice. To express extreme joyfulness and gladness despite the situation or circumstance. To express the extreme gladness. Look what he says here in verse 18. Look at verse 18. In everything, give thanks. So you're telling me if I wreck my car, I'm supposed to give thanks? If I lose my job, I'm supposed to give thanks? Now listen, balance, don't give thanks for losing your job. Don't be like, well, praise God, I lost my job, hallelujah. No, that's, <laughs> that's stupid. That's stupid. But the Lord trying to teach me something. No, 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 no. You give thanks in the midst of it. See, most people don't believe this because they, they say, well, I can, I can only rejoice when things look favorable. I can only rejoice when things are going good. I can only rejoice when, when uh, my feelings are, are, are on, on the upside. No, God is saying, even in the midst of your situation, give thanks. Why? Look what he said here, verse 18. For this is the will of God for you. This is the will of God for you. Go over to Philippians real quick. I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures here. Go to Philippians. So rejoice forevermore, praise God. Look at Philippians chapter 4. All right. If you have it, say amen. Okay, Philippians chapter 4, and we look at verse 6. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now, I want to remind you that this is the Apostle Paul writing this epistle to the church at Philippi. And he wrote this epistle while he was in jail. Now, the jails back then, now, I'm not saying jails today are nice, but they were better than, they were, they were worse than the ones today. Because I see guys on the internet, they got cell phones in jail, they, they working out, they, they looking good in jail nowadays. I mean, not saying you want to go there, but it's definitely not as bad as it used to be. But when Paul was in jail, it was a dungeon. It was dirt floor. It was a, a rock wall. It was not glamorous. He's writing this in jail, telling the church of Philippi to rejoice in the Lord always. How can a man be in prison and make those statements? He knew something. He wasn't moved by his situation or circumstance. Think about what Paul went through. Paul went through so much. He was beat. He was persecuted. He was lied on. He was forsaken. I mean, he went through a lot. But yet, he still wrote this word, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, again, my subtopic is the choice to rejoice. It is not a feeling. You know, I have two sons, and... They're, they're, they're six and, and ten, and when, when they were babies, that's all they knew was their feelings, right? They got hungry, they cried. They got wet, they cried. They got sleepy, hot, irritated, they cried. And a lot of times when we are looking at ourselves in the spirit realm, sometimes we're spiritual babies. You go through something. You start crying. Somebody talk bad about you, you start crying. You get a negative doubt, you start crying. That's, that's immaturity. It takes a mature person, a mature believer, to be able to go and rejoice even when the situation is not favorable. And see, that's what God wants to do. I'm going to show you in Romans chapter 5 in a moment how God want to take us to maturity. He want to take us to a place where we are no longer moved by emotions because the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. So the key is 
We must align our will and our emotions up with the word of God. Put up my next point here. So rejoicing is a commandment, which is the will of God. And we must align our will with God's will. He said this is the will of God in Thessalonians. Rejoicing is not an option. It's a commandment. And I know what you're thinking, like, how? It, it makes no sense. How can, I, how can I rejoice when there's nothing to rejoice about? I'm going to give you some options, some things to rejoice about. Look at Matthew chapter 5. I want, I want you to see what Jesus had to say. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Praise God. Matthew chapter 5. And look at verse 10. He says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Hold on. You mean tell me somebody's talking about me, running my name in the mud, lying on me on the job, my family members talking about me behind my back, and you telling me to rejoice? Look what he said here. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Did they not persecute Jesus? Yeah. See, a lot of times when, when, we, when we hear somebody's talking about us, the first reaction we have is not rejoice. <laughs> you want to give them a piece of your mind. I, I know I, I'm the same way. You know, you want to go off. I'm like, look, I'm picking up my phone. Matter of fact, I'm going to the house. I'm going to look them in their face. Tell me what you just said about me. But then I'll be, you know what, God? No, I'm not going to do that because the Lord will fight my battle. But, but how, do you re how can you rejoice when someone's talking about you? How can you rejoice when they are doing everything, calling you every name in the book except for a child of God? He said when they revile you. What does revile mean? I mean talk evil about you. I mean just run your name in the mud. Just, just talk trash about you like you are nothing but a low-down dog. He said, rejoice. And I'm, look, I'm asking God, like, God, how can I rejoice when they do that? You know why? Because it's not about what he said or she said, but about what he said. Glory to God. <laughs> See, when you understand what God says about you and what God thinks about you, it doesn't matter what no one else says about you. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about because you are caught up in what he said, she said. You don't understand, but I know what God said, but I heard what they said too. Like, no, you need to understand what God is saying because people are going to talk about you. How many people know everybody not going to like you? I mean, I, I, think, I think of myself as a nice guy, you know. I think of myself, I'm a, I'm a pretty likable guy, you know. I haven't really had too many haters, but I'd be a fool to think I don't have haters. I got haters, but I'm not worried about my haters because it's not about them. It's about him. God got a plan for my life. I know what he says about me, so I'm not going to get caught up in what he says, she said, what they said, what they think about me, or he think he top stuff. Like, no, God said I was top stuff. You can like me or don't like me. I know y'all look at me sometimes when I'm here preaching like, this boy be talking some big boy stuff. Listen, I'm only bragging on my God. I'm only bragging on him. He said, rejoice when they talk about you. Now, that takes a choice. That takes a choice. You can't be in your feelings. Look at this in the Amplified Bible. Verse 11. Bless, happy to be envied, and spiritually prosperous with life joy, satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, 
regardless of your outward conditions, are you, when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely on my account, be glad and supremely joyful for your reward in heaven is great, strong, intense, for in the same way people persecuted the prophets who before you. So in other words, he said, when, they, when you are persecuted intensely, you need to rejoice intensely, rejoice intensely praise God. I know, I know it don't make sense. You're thinking like, how can I be rejoicing when, when, when I'm being persecuted like nobody's business? Why? Because God says so. It's his commandment. It's his commandment. But you can't focus. The thing is, your focus has to be on his word and not what other people are saying. If we focus on what other people are saying, we won't rejoice. Look at this. Uh, look at my key point here. Rejoicing. My key point here. Rejoicing is a choice, an act of your will, regardless of your outward conditions. And my scripture reference, turn over there, Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18. So Jesus said we should be rejoicing. And if I'm going to listen to anybody, it's going to be Jesus. Hallelujah. Habakkuk 3. All right, verse 17 through 18. All right. If you got it, say amen. Okay. Now listen to this. Although the fig tree should not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Let me bring this up to date, because I know y'all talking about, I don't have no fig tree. I know I have no olive tree. I don't have no flocks and no herds. So what is he talking about? What he's saying is, although there'll be no money in your bank, there'll be no food in your refrigerator, you don't have the dream house or dream car you're thinking about, your marriage can be going through the worst situation there is, you could be in a, a, a bad relationship with your families. He's saying, although all these things are going on, look at verse 18. He says, yet I will rejoice. Yet I will rejoice. No gas in my car. What, what you going to do? I didn't hear you. No gas in your car. What you going to do? No money in your pocket. What are you going to do? You don't know where you're going to get your next meal from. What are you going to do? This is a decision. He said, I will. See, the word will is a choice. Hallelujah. Yeah, I will rejoice. But notice he's not rejoicing in the lack. He's not rejoicing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the insufficiency. He's rejoicing what? In the Lord. He's rejoicing in the Lord. That's how we can rejoice. In the Lord. We don't rejoice when, when things are going bad because they're bad. No, we rejoice in the Lord. Has God been good to you? Yes. Has he done anything for you? Yes. Do you think he got a good outcome for your life? Yes. Well, take your mind off your current situation and think about your, your past victories and where you're going to be and rejoice in that. He said, yeah, I will rejoice in the Lord. See, a lot of times we've been trying to rejoice in the victory. You can rejoice in the victory. That's okay. But can you rejoice in the defeat? Your rejoicing is not in the thing. Your rejoicing is in the Lord. I mean, it's important. Underline that in your Bible. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. This is so important because we are basing our joy, our praise, our, 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 our dance, our laughter, everything off of if things are going well. But what do you do when things are not going well? What do you do when you pray for something and it does not come to pass? What do you do if you, you, you are, are believing for that promotion on your job and they give it to somebody else? I'm going to tell you what you're supposed to do. The Bible says when one of the members of the body of Christ are honored, guess what we should do? 
rejoice. You hear about so-and-so got a new car. What do you do? No, some of y'all don't. You might be a little hater. You know how some people are. You get a new car, they go, well, so-and-so got, got the one that got the, the full package on it. You got the factory on yours. <laughs> you know, you celebrating your birthday and you about to have a great trip, go out of the country and you go into a nice resort and you telling everybody about this resort going up. They tell you, well, you know, I went and stayed over there in the mansion, you know, in a 10 room resort and I had the whole, what they got to do with my birthday? <laughs> when someone is honored, we should do what? Rejoice. This is important because you got to watch yourself. Sometimes, you know how it is, you, you hear somebody talking about some goodness of God and, and you know, we all want to testify. We all want to share God's goodness. But sometimes it, it's not the right time. You should be just be quiet and say, praise God, I'm so happy for you. Not trying to sneak in your little, let me tell you about mine. I'm going to warn up this person. No, no, listen. So-and-so got a new house. Praise God, I'm so glad for you. You don't walk in there, well, well dad, these rooms kind of small. That's a hater, man. No, you rejoice. And since why I say it's a choice. It's a choice. Because your flesh definitely want to say something. Your flesh want to be like, you know what, they ain't better than me. But no, your spirit, man, want to rejoice. So it's a choice. You have to make a decision to rejoice. And this is what God wants want to get at. Because sometimes we're waiting for things to look good for us. And things to be going favorable for us before we rejoice. Can you rejoice for somebody else? Can you rejoice when someone else is getting the victory? Or, 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 or you can't, you, you know, you, you got to be the one always in the spotlight. No, we need to rejoice with each other. Praise God. So, you know, and you look at back here, he said, although, look at this in the Amplifier. He said, though the fig tree does not blossom, and there is no fruit on the vines. Though the product of the olive fails and the fields yield no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the victorious God of my salvation. See, we're not waiting to be victorious. We're already victorious. You're not waiting to win. We already won. We're winners already. See, a lot of times we think that, you know, we need to be in the position of, of on top all the time in order to be a winner. Do you know that my sons are, their last name is Wooten, regardless if they leave this place, leave my house, they still going to be a Wooten? Get, get in your mind for a second. They're they going to be my son. There's nothing they can do to change that. So if our father, he, he said here, we will exalt in the victorious God of our salvation. So if our father is a winner and he's our daddy, what does that make you and I? Winners. He already won for us. He's already defeated the devil. He's already defeated sickness and disease. All we got to do is walk in it. But if we're focused on our outward circumstances and situations, we're going to think we're defeated. We're going to think we're losers. No, we need to focus on, on the one winning King Jesus. So my key point here is our focus, the focus of our rejoicing must be in the hope and expectation of the goodness of God. The focus of our rejoicing must be in the hope and expectation of the goodness of God. See, you can't focus on your current situation. You cannot focus on how Things are looking right now. Again, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And if you're looking at what's, uh, what's around you and what's going on in this world, you're going to be sorrowful. You're going to be depressed. You're looking at all the, the wars that's going on. You got uh, inflation. You got sickness and disease. You got a pandemic. You got uh, high gas prices. You got high interest rates. You got all these things. If you look at all that stuff 24-7, you won't re re rejoice at anything. Have you ever called somebody and you was in a good mood? 
And the moment you start talking to them, something happened to your mood. You can't explain, like, what just, I, I know. Or, 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 or you, you having a good time, you having a good time, and your phone ring, and as soon as you look at that, that thing, your flesh will hit that red button. Some people, they didn't know how to drain your joy. Some people, that every time you talk to them, they always are talking about something negative. They always complaining about something. They got something negative to say. Watch out for those people because those people are joy drainers. They will suck you, drive your joy. I mean, every time you talk to them, it could be your mama now. I don't, I don't know who it could be. I know we love our mom, but it can be your mom. Even if your mama, hey, you might need to put the word on her. Well, mom, the word say this. Because one thing I'm not going to do, I'm not going to let somebody steal my joy. I'm not going to let them steal my joy. Look at uh, Romans chapter 5. Now, this is where it gets tough right here. I'm going to be honest. Romans chapter 5, verse 2 says, Through him also we have our access and entrance or introduction by faith into this grace, state of God's favor in which we firmly and safely stand. Let us rejoice and exalt in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. That's the easy part. That, it's easy to know we can rejoice knowing that God got a good final outcome from, uh, for us. That's what he said here. Let us rejoice in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the goodness of God. But look at verse 3. He said, moreover, now, let us exalt and triumph when things are looking good, is that what it said? He said, what? Let us exalt and triumph when? In our troubles. This is the hard part. And rejoice when all is going well. Now, what did he say? In our sufferings. Oh, it's quiet in here now. Ooh. Ooh. I didn't write this. I just read it to you. He said, let us rejoice in our sufferings. That's contrary. That's something that your flesh don't want to do. When there's pain in your body, when it's, it's in the middle of the night, and you can't sleep, you're tossing and turning, you're trying to figure out something, a situation, a problem you're going through. You need a bill paid. You need your son, your daughter off drugs, off the street. You're trying to figure this thing out. Your tribulation, your, str your struggle. He said rejoice. Mm. That's a choice. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. And, and a lot of times, what God is doing is he wants, he's not bringing that situation, but he's using that situation. Look what he said here in the rest of the verse. How can we rejoice in trouble and suffering? Look what he said here. He said, rejoice in our sufferings. What's the next word? Knowing. Knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship Produce patience and unswerving endurance. That's how you rejoice. You know that I might not feel like rejoicing right now, but I know if I could just make it through this situation, I'm going to come out stronger. I'm going to come out better. I'm going to have more endurance. I'm going to have more patience. But see what it is, a lot of times in our lives, we don't want to go through nothing. Y'all know that. Y'all know that's true. I mean, we have, we have hope and aspirations. I mean, I think about in the natural working out. We all want to want to look good. Who, who don't want to look good? Okay, we all want. 
But who want to go through the process? Who want to go through the discipline it takes to watch what you eat? Who want to go through the process of waking up at 5 in the morning to hit the gym, to spend 45 minutes to an hour? We want to look good, right? But we don't want to go through the process. And what God is saying, I want your faith to be perfected, but you got to go through the process. And while you're going through the process, it may not be joyous, but I still want you to rejoice. When you first start working out and you wake up at 5 in the morning, I mean, you drag, you're like, oh, Lord, you're trying to you get yourself together, you, you're, like, you're getting your coffee, you're doing everything. You're like, and you get in there and you just lay on the floor, like, I'm going to stretch for a minute. You ain't stretching, you resting, you sleep. I'm going to stretch. Then you go through the motion, you pick up the lightest weight you can. And just, you don't feel like being there initially. But if you keep doing this thing day in and day out, one week after the next, the next month comes. After a while, you're going to learn to enjoy this thing. Because you know it's working for your good. It's not trying to hurt you. It's not trying to destroy It's making you better. Look what he say here. Look, look at the rest of this verse in, uh, in the Amplified. Knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patience and unserving endurance. And watch this. And endurance, fortitude, develops maturity of character. Maturity. So when we are rejoicing, that's a sign of maturity. But when we're complaining, that's a sign of immaturity. And that's what God is after. He's after us developing our character and becoming spiritually mature. We should grow up. We should become mature in our faith to where when situations happen, we know how to respond. We know how, I, listen, maturity isn't based on a number. That is quiet. Maturity is not based on a number. You could be 40, 50, 60, 70, and still be a babe. Maturity, like he just said, is based on knowledge, what you know, and your ability to apply what you know. You can be 70 years old and still be a fool because you don't, you, you don't apply what you know. Maturity. God wants to see our faith perfected and matured and completed. He don't want to see us like the children of Israel. Notice he called them children. He don't want to see us like the children of Israel, 40 years going around the same mountain, going through the same problem, the same situation, the same circumstance, and never get through it. Some of us know we've been going through some of the same situations for decade after decade. The same problem. Every year you say, this is my last time dealing with this situation, but yet you still refuse to go through the process. And God wants to see us go to the next level. He wants to see us go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. But it takes us going through the process. This is the hard part. See, faith, we know about faith. <laughs> This is a faith church. I, sometimes I don't even want to talk about faith because I've seen this elementary in this church. But I'm going to break it down. Faith, we know, comes from the word of God. It must be in your heart, right? You must release it with your mouth, right? And you must act on what you believe. Correspond. That's, that's the basis of faith. That's a mini sermon for you right there. But one other element of faith that we don't want to talk about is faith must be tested. Faith must be tested because God or us, we cannot use our faith until it has been proved. Think, think about it in that. Can you use nothing we buy? Makeup, car, clothes, food, nothing we purchased and use can be used until it's what? Tested. Are you going to jump in a car they haven't done any tests on? You're just going to get in the car, just, you know what, 
it's brand new, I'm going to go and you, no. You want to make sure that car has been through the test. And God wants to say, he want to make sure that when we go through situations and we put, he, he entrusts to us his word, he wants to make sure that our faith will not fail. He wants to make sure our faith has been tested and proved and tried. We don't want to go through the test, though. He said here, look at this. He's trying to develop maturity of character. Look what he's, the next part. And what? Approved faith. You see that? Approved faith. What is he after? Faith that's been proven. And tried integrity. A character of this sort produces habit of joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. I told you, this, this is the next step. We know about joy. We know we should have the joy of the Lord. It's our strength. But how do we operate in joy when we're going through troubles and, str and struggles? That's maturity. This is something that the Holy Spirit told me. He said here, complain and have your joy drained. But rejoice and be a joy force. Complain and have your joy drained or rejoice and be a joy force. What does that mean? You can sit there and complain about how bad things are, how terrible things are looking, and watch your spirit man become empty. But you can choose, make one choice to not do that and rejoice and watch your spirit man become so big and so strong that not only does it change you, but it changed your entire situation around you. You become a force. Go to, uh, hold on, let me give you a key point. That's what I was supposed to do. My key point here. Rejoicing is not based on what we see on the outside, but what we believe on the inside. Rejoicing is not based on what we see on the outside, but what we believe on the inside. Praise God. And then the last part, it is an expression of our faith. It's an expression of our faith. Look, go, go to 1 Peter, and I'm almost done. Y'all supposed to rejoice. <laughs> Some of you did, you were just too scared to do it. Go to 1 Peter. No, for real, I'm almost done. Because I think, I think y'all got the point. I think the Holy Spirit done got you. Y'all was quiet. Yeah. I know I was quiet when I was studying. I said, oh. But, but rejoicing is not based on what we see. It's based on what we, we believe. Look, look at this. 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's look at verse 6. He says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Look at the Amplifier real quick in that verse. You should be exceedingly glad on this account, thou know for a while, though now for a while, you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations. He said, rejoice greatly while you're going through. Then he says here in verse 7, back to the King James, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, let me break that down, what he's saying. He's comparing our faith to gold, which is a precious metal. And back in the Bible days, the, when they would work with precious metals such as gold and silver, they would use a uh, refining process. They would have this huge clay pot, 
and they'll put uh, the, the metal in the pot and then heat the fire as high as they can make it until it melts the metal down. And then as that metal begins to break down, then all of the uh, impurities and imperfections that was in the metal or the gold or the silver would rise to the top. It would be called dross. And what he would do is, the refiner would do is, he would begin to skim the, the imperfections off the top because he's after one thing, he's after pure gold or purified metal. And, and as he would skim off the top, he would heat it up higher, keep blowing the fans, the flame, keep heating it hotter, and more, more uh, periods would come to the top. He keeps skimming. And then the key indication of when he knew it was pure gold, he would lean over the pot. And the test was, can I see my reflection in the pot? Pure gold. No more impurities. No more imperfections. Pure gold. He will lean over and say, can I see my, inflect, my reflection? What God is saying, I'm going to try your faith with the fire. I'm your refiner. I'm the one that's going to perfect your faith. I'm trying to do this not to break you down, but to remove those impurities out of your life. I want to get all that stuff that's stopping you from getting my goodness and my best for your life. I want to get it out of your life, and I'm going to do it. I'm watching this. I'm going to do it the same way he was looking at pot seeds. I'm going to do it until I see my image in your life. But we don't want to go through the fire. God is our refiner. He's the one who wants to perfect our faith. He's the one that says, I'm going to make sure that you're going to make a way out of this thing, a way of escape. I'll be your way of escape. But while you're going through it, I'm going to perfect you in this process. We don't want to go through that. I know I didn't. <laughs> I'm being honest. But once I understood what God was after and where he was taking me, I knew it was necessary. I said, God, I, listen, whatever you want, burn me. For, burn me like for, I, I want it, God. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like your son. I want to be made in his image and his likeness. I know my shortcomings. I know my fault, my flaws and my failures. Get rid of them. Get rid of them all. Burn. Put me through the fire. We used to run from, from tests. Binding the devil like crazy. I bind the devil right now in Jesus' name. It ain't the devil all the time. Did you know that sometimes when things don't work out, that rejection is for your protection? That house that you wanted to buy, you were believing God, making 39 confessions a day for it, and it still you didn't get it? Rejoice. Guess what? That wasn't the devil. That was God's protection. You didn't know that house had faulty systems. That car, that person you wanted to get with, that mate you were looking for, believing God for, that went and married somebody else, that was for your protection. <laughs> we, we need to be careful we don't just go and bind the devil all the time. Really, it's God. God is saying, no, this is not my best. This is not my timing. Wait on my timing. Because I'm going I'm to put you through this right here so that when my time does come, you are ready for it. Amen. Hope y'all hear me this morning. That's what it's about. Because as we go through this thing called life, you got to understand it's like school. You can't just keep, you know, I said, no child left behind. No, they don't, in the kingdom of God, that don't fly. They don't fly. You're not, God ain't just going to pass you to the next level just because you're his child. No, you're going to go through this thing till you pass this test. You're not going to the next level till you pass this level. Because if you can't pass this level, you ain't ready for what's on the next level. What's on the next level is something you can't handle right now. You need to pass the test on this level. Then we can go to the next level. But we want to we just speed past the process. Praise God. Let's get back to this word. Um, yeah, give us some praise. Give us some praise. Hallelujah. Let's, let's look at this. So he says in verse 7, look at it in the Amplified. So that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. Your faith, with this, which is uh, infinitely more precious than the perishable gold, which is tested and purified by fire. This proving of your faith is intended 
to redound to your praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, is revealed. And when is he going to be revealed? After you go through the fire. Verse 8. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We need to rejoice based on what we believe, not what we see. Our eyes should be focused on the one thing and one, Jesus Christ. And if we do that, it don't matter what we face. It don't matter what we go through. We're looking at one thing and one thing only, Jesus Christ. You lose your job, I'm focused on Jesus. Healing, I need healing, I'm focused on Jesus. I'm not worried about what I'm going through because my eyes is fixed on Jesus alone. Look at this in the Amplifier, verse 8. He said, without having seen him. How many people seen Jesus before? Thank you. I'm going to have to cast out some devils in here. Without having seen him, you love him. Do you love him? Yeah, you, ain't, you never seen Jesus, but you love him. Though you do not even now see him, you believe in him and exalt and thrill with inexpressible and glorious, triumphant, heavenly joy. That's what it's all about. So the next time you face with a problem or situation, take your eyes off of that problem and get your eyes back in this book. Get your eyes back on Jesus and begin to rejoice in that he's our savior. He's our triumphant leader, our, our, our champion. Undefeated, he's never been defeated before. He never lost a battle. That's what our hope is in. If we continue to think about what we're going through, then we'll always complain. But if we take our eyes and put it on this word and get it on Jesus, we can rejoice. Amen? We can rejoice. Praise God. Well, I hope y'all got something this morning out of this message. Stand to your feet. Let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's rejoice. Let's rejoice. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Let's